welcome to week two, where we're going to take a look at how to convert your yard into a garden. Now, the examples that I'm going to give you today are they're going to be based on if you have a quite flat lot. Reason being is that we're going to be positioning some raised beds on this lot and you don't want to have to dig into the hillside too much. Um, luckily for us in Saskatchewan, all we have is pretty much flat land, so this works quite nicely. So what I'm going to be running through today uh, with my wonderful Lego props here <laughs> is that uh, we're going to be taking a look at a couple different scenarios of urban lots. So we're going to be taking a look at if you have existing lawn that you want to turn into a garden. So this could be your front yard or your backyard. Ideally, you want an area that's probably going to get about six to eight hours of sunlight per day. So that might factor in where you're going to be placing your garden. Or you might have bare soil that is uh, covered with weeds because maybe you just built a new house and you haven't had a chance to landscape yet. This technique that I'm going to show you today can work for either of these situations just fine. Now, when most people want to put a garden in their yard, they often think that they have to rip out a whole bunch of lawn by hand or with a bobcat or something like that. And that's pretty daunting. And to do an in the ground garden is going to take a lot of prep work with that soil, especially in Regina where, our clay, where we have such clay soil that's really hard and really quite alkaline. So raised, building some raised beds is going to be your best option. So what we want to do with our ground is we want to take, uh, whether we have the bare soil with weeds or the grass, we're just going to work right on top of what we already have. So I'm going to work uh, with my grass plot here for this example. And what you want to do with your grass is you want to lay down a bunch of manure. Now, the fresher the better. However, if you are in a city lot and you don't want to offend your neighbors, you can use really well rotted manure as well. So you want to cover the ground with a decent layer of manure. So I would say, you know, about an inch or so all throughout. Then what we want to do with our plot is we want to take a whole bunch of flattened cardboard. Now the flattened cardboard is going to be from a really heavy type of cardboard. So things like a refrigerator box or the box that your stove comes in or furniture comes in. We do not want cardboard that is thin like a cereal box or something like that. Um, it just won't be durable enough and it'll break down much faster than we need it to in this example. So what we want to do with our cardboard is we want to lay it down over top of the manure over and over and over again and with quite a bit of overlap so that none of the grass will grow through. It's better to put too much on than too little at this point. And just like my example, where this paper that I'm using as cardboard is bent and it's sticking up and it's not laying flat to the contour of the land, that's exactly what's going to happen with your cardboard too. You're going to have pieces that are maybe going to stick up if there's a little bit of a, an undulation with the ground or something like that. So what we want to do in this situation is we want to hose this entire thing down and really saturate it. Once you've saturated it, it will lay and conform to the ground itself. Now, I'm not going to do that right now, otherwise I am going to get soaking wet here in this example. Now, the reason behind the manure in this example is that we do want to get rid of the grass that's underneath this over time. And Although we've blocked it from the sunlight with the cardboard, we also need a bunch of microorganisms such as earthworms to basically get rid of the grass in the meantime. So in this example, what happens with our manure is that it acts as a bit of an attractant for all of the earthworms and life that's underneath the ground, underneath the grass. And they're all gonna come up to the surface and they're all going to eat that grass and decompose it and turn it all into soil. So underneath this cardboard layer, and including the cardboard layer, layer eventually, all the earthworms are gonna come up and eat away and turn it all into soil. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about what to do on top of this, um, but I want to give you a bit of an understanding as to why we're doing this. Now, in permaculture especially, what we're trying to do is we're always trying to build soil. And what a lot of people are tempted to do instead is to put a bunch of landscape fabric down and then put their raised beds on top. And the issue with that is that you don't get this beneficial interaction that we're going to get by doing it with this method. With this method, there will be zero waste, there will be zero garbage, um, there won't be any edges of this landscape fabric sticking up over time. Everything will decompose entirely, just like a forest floor, which is kind of the aim of what we're trying to do here. So once we have this cardboard fully saturated and it's molded to the ground really nicely, we've got our whole area covered, then we can put our raised beds in. Now, our raised beds can be rectangles, they can be squares, they can pretty much be any size or shape that you want. You can make them fancy, you can make them a horseshoe shape, U shape, anything like that. Just keep in mind that you're never going to want to walk or step or lean on the soil. So when we place these beds down, you're going to see that with my Lego guy person, um, my looks like a stormtrooper of some sort, um, maybe we'll all be wearing masks like this one day outdoors, I don't know. But with this guy, you can see that with the wood edge of this bed and the growing area, he can easily reach to the middle of the bed from all angles. Now, we want to be able to reach the center of the bed from either side. We do not want to have to ever step or lean in here. So this bed would not work very well for that because he can't reach the middle. So this bed to me is kind of the wrong proportions. If you wanted to make it square like this, you probably wouldn't want it any more than four feet by four feet, just so that you could reach the middle. Now, the width of this bed is gonna be dependent on how long your arms are. I personally have very short arms. I find that three and a half feet across is pretty much the max for me to comfortably lean and reach into the middle and be able to lead. Whereas um, my husband who's six foot three has no problem with a four foot bed or even wider. So depending on um, your accessibility and your mobility and your height and your stature, you may want to adjust the width of your bed. Now, once you've adjusted the width of your bed for comfort, it can be any length that you want at that point because you're just gonna be walking along the beds from either side. So once we place our bed frames, now the frames that I have here have a bottom to them. Normally you wouldn't do that. You would just put the outer frame straight onto the cardboard so that over time, everything that's filled in this bed will um, kind of co-mingle with the, the composted cardboard and grass and everything over time so that the roots of the plants in the bed can go down as deep as they want. Now, as far as building the raised beds themselves, there are quite a few different options of materials that you can use. I have seen a lot of people use old pallets that they've taken apart, um, railroad ties, uh, pressure treated wood. Uh, I really like to steer away from those if possible, just because even though the chemicals aren't as harsh as they used to be with pressure treated wood. They don't leak arsenic. Uh, they don't leach arsenic into our soil the same way or anything like that. I just don't like taking the risk of having any sort of chemicals leaching into my soil personally. However, if you are on a very tight budget and that's what you have available, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, I know lots of people that do it and have no ill effects from it. Most people end up choosing cedar because it has a natural resin that prevents rot. Now, with the cedar, uh, first of all, it's very expensive. And second of all, it comes in kind of limited dimensions. So very often you'll find it uh, in, most, most people will use what's called like a five quarter board and that's one inch thick. But I find that when you use those deck boards that are, um, 
they say that they're six inches wide, but they're actually five and a half inches wide. I find that when people use those boards, they tend to warp over time because they're just not thick enough. So it will contain your soil and it will look nice maybe the first year, but over time you're going to get a lot of warping and bending of that wood. So what I've been using a lot is actually two by 10 furs. So fur has the same kind of properties where it's uh, rot resistant as well. Only with the two by tens, you're getting a board that's one and a half inches thick and nine and a quarter inches in depth. So um, I find that also the dimensions of that lumber works really well for determining the height of the bed. Um, two boards of the two by 10 fur is 18 and a half inches. So for me, that planting depth pretty much allows me to plant anything. Um, you can get away with just one board, but I see a lot of people that just end up making their raised beds just a little bit too shallow because they might only use one of those five quarter by six uh, boards, those cedar boards, in which case you only have about five and a half inches of planting depth, and that's really not enough space for a lot of roots especially if you want to grow things like carrots or any sort of root vegetable. So I'd recommend at least a depth of 12 inches and more if you can afford it. And also just keep in mind that the higher you go, the less you're going to have to bend over as well. So very often um, the 18 and a half inches, you still have to bend over a little bit. You could even put one more row of boards on there just to lift it up just that much more and be that much more comfortable. Once these beds are in place and you've got them on top of the wet cardboard, you can fill this in with a whole bunch of mulch. Now, the reason why I say mulch and not rocks is that the mulch will act as a barrier over top of all of this for weed suppression and moisture retention and all that kind of stuff, but it will also eventually break down the soil over time. And also, if you've ever pulled weeds out of bark mulch versus weeds out of pea rock, you'll notice which one's much, much easier. Or even crushed, like crushed rock that's kind of large really hurts the fingers. And very often the weeds just break off. They don't really even pull out easy. So I don't recommend rock because inevitably you're going to end up with dirt somewhere in those rocks and weeds will grow. And then you're going to be almost forced to use chemicals of some sort or drastic measures to get rid of the weeds. So if we cover this all with mulch in between the garden beds, so bark mulch, um, kind of big tree uh, shreds, things like that, we want to have it about 10 inches or more of mulch because over time it's going to flatten. So we want a lot of mulch on here. And then just like a forest floor, we're not going to get a lot of weeds coming up at that point. It's just going to keep on converting into soil and perhaps, you know, in every five or 10 years, you may want to add a little bit more to the top. But if you start off with a good generous amount, all of the weeds beneath, all of the grass beneath should be killed off by the time that kind of wears down a little bit. So in the next section, we're going to look at what we fill the raised beds with, what kind of growing medium we want to use, and how we would uh, go about mixing the right proportions for that.